Spring 1918, and against the backdrop of the Great War, a new and mysterious illness is quietly spreading. Nobody knows what it is, nobody knows where it came from, but it is beginning to claim lives in frightening numbers. It is the 1918 influenza pandemic, or more commonly referred to as the Spanish flu. It will go on to infect approximately one third of the global population of the early 20th century, some 500 million people, and ultimately kill an estimated 50 million people. Some estimations claim the death toll could have been as high as 100 million, making it one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. History records that the outbreak began in the spring of 1918. Exactly where it began is disputed, as World War I media censorship in Britain, France, Germany and the United States prevented reports in order to maintain morale amongst the fighting troops. It was also high in the minds of the opposing generals that the other side must not get so much as a hint that a problem existed that could be compromising their ability to wage war. This information blackout meant that the disease could now spread, uncontrolled and unabated amongst the troops, as there was no large-scale effective operation to isolate it, and absolutely no possibility of quarantine in whole battalions of soldiers who may be showing signs of the disease. About this time in Spain, King Alfonso XIII became ill with flu-like symptoms. The 32-year-old king's condition quickly deteriorated, and he became gravely ill. During World War I, Spain had remained neutral in the conflict, and this was due to the fact that the Spanish monarchy had close family links with both sides, and not least due to large divisions of public opinion throughout Spain. This neutrality meant that Spain did not fall under any wartime censorship restrictions, and reports of the king's condition and subsequent recovery made headline news around the world. So while flu outbreaks amongst the warring countries went unreported, it gave the impression that Spain was the epicentre of the disease, and therefore the resultant pandemic would be dubbed the Spanish flu. It is extremely unlikely that we will ever know exactly where the disease originated, but there are a few theories. English virologist and professor at Queen Mary University of London, John Oxford, wrote in a study that as early as 1916, in a British expeditionary force staging and hospital camp in Etaples in France, there was an outbreak of a new disease that had a high mortality rate and exhibited flu-like symptoms. Professor Oxford went on to report that in early 1917, at an army barracks in Aldershot, England, there was also a similar outbreak. Military pathologists would later conclude that these outbreaks were indeed caused by the same disease as the 1918 flu. Transition camps and hospitals at this time were ideal environments for respiratory diseases to flourish, as thousands of casualties of war, as well as thousands of transit and soldiers would pass through every day. Additionally, the fact that animal livestock such as pigs and chickens were kept in close proximity has fueled speculation that this is where a precursor virus could have received the opportunity to jump the species barrier into humans. In the United States, some have suggested that the disease could have originated in Haskell County, Kansas. However, evidence suggests that the mortality rate was significantly lower than that shown in Europe. China seemed to be much less affected than the rest of the world, and indeed their regular flu season of 1918 has been recorded as being particularly mild. And this has led to speculation that the virus began in China, and that the Chinese population had acquired a herd immunity to the virus. It has also been suggested that tens of thousands of Chinese labourers came to work behind British and French lines and brought the virus with them. This was fuelled by archival evidence that a respiratory illness struck northern China in November of 1917 and was found a year later to be identical to the Spanish flu. Despite all of the rumours and speculation, it is fair to say that we will never truly know where it started or how it began its initial spread. What we do know for certain is that it spread viciously throughout the troops on the battlefield and then transported back home to their homelands, following the cessation of hostilities in November of 1918. It was a new version of the flu, but like all flu viruses, it spread easily as droplets through the air after coughing or sneezing of an infected person. Most flu viruses are problematic to the vulnerable, either very young or very old, but this strain of the flu would go on to have a devastating effect on young, healthy adults. The first wave of the virus was mild, causing symptoms such as chills, fever and fatigue. People infected by this first wave would usually recover after several days, and the death toll remained low. 
For example, in the United States there were 75,000 flu related deaths in the first six months of 1918, and when compared to the 63,000 deaths during the same time period of 1915, it showed only a slight increase. However, a second wave spread in the autumn of 1918, and this wave was proved much more deadly. A new mutation had developed and was far more virulent, and October of 1918 would record the highest fatality rate of the whole pandemic. It would cause skin to turn blue and the victim's lungs would fill with fluid. Victims would die within hours or days of showing symptoms. It is suggested that this increased severity was attributed to the environment of the soldiers fighting the war. Thousands of infected patients in very close, filthy, unhygienic conditions, crowded trains, crowded hospitals were a deadly combination. Following the war, this new deadly strain was transported back home with the troops to wreak havoc. Fortunately, those who had already had and recovered from the first milder wave seemed to have developed an immunity to the second wave. However, the most vulnerable people were those just like the soldiers of the trenches, young and otherwise fit and healthy. January of 1919 would see a third wave of the disease, starting in Australia but then rapidly spreading throughout Europe and the United States and it persisted until June of 1919. Mercifully, it was less severe than the second wave, but it was still more dangerous than the first. And reluctant to disappear, the Spanish flu had one final outbreak in a fourth wave in the spring of 1920. It was far less widespread, occurring in only isolated areas and recorded a very low mortality rate. The effects of the pandemic were global, not just in the awful death toll, but also the effects on the economies of affected areas. Even in areas with small outbreaks, businesses and schools closed in much the same way as we have seen with the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. And despite the terrible death rates, the Spanish flu would quickly subside in the minds of the public. Almost a case of that the flu was just another dreadful consequence of the war. And now that the war to end all wars was over, so too was the risk of this killer flu. Public awareness of the dangers of new viruses would remain low until the 1990s and 2000s with the emergence of new variants such as bird flu, swine flu, SARS and MERS, and more recently, COVID-19.